Kevin Brady, who we're happy to have tonight, represents the 8th District of Texas. He's the Deputy Republican Whip and serves on the Ways and Means Committee, which gives him a little authority to talk about what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, I didn't know this. Two-thirds? Did you know that? Two-thirds of the federal budget goes through that committee? It's a lot. Uh, it's getting bigger every day. Uh, Kevin lives in Montgomery County with his wife and their two sons. Please welcome Congressman Kevin Brady. Mark, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, but MSNBC just gets more fair and balanced every day, doesn't it? Wow, it's pretty wrong. I didn't see Rachel Maddow. I'm never going to be able to raise my hand when they ask if I see uh, a segments like that. But the truth of the matter is, um, you are doing such important work. And, and we all know uh, you are known by your enemies. And the fact that it, it is not easy to fight for freedom. It's not easy to fight for a limited constitutional government. It's not easy to fight for individual rights over the government's rights. You are doing it. Others have tried to fight. It's gotten hard and they've given up. You're not giving up. That's why those people are out there protesting you today, because you're not going to give up. So I'm just saying God bless you. Thank you for what you're doing. With your permission, let me talk through some key issues, if I could, real quickly, before we get to question and answers about um, some key things are coming up that are, going to, that are going to hammer people, families, and businesses in a major way at the end of the year uh, if this president gets his way. And what we need to do to stop tax hikes and stop this government from growing you even further at the end of the, in the year. Here, let me talk real quick the economy, the spending crisis that you and I know we're in. End of the year, some things that are happening, this tax clip, the automatic spending cuts to defense. There's a bunch of other things happening at the end of the year. Red tape, how it's killing our business. and then. Because the Ways and Means Committee, Joint Economic Committee that I uh, run for Republicans in the House and Senate, Jim DeMint's my counterpart in the Senate. We did the chart on Obamacare. We had a lot of questions about what now. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, the economy, jobs report last month, 160,000. The media acted like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Bottom line is, that's barely breaking. With our population, you need that much just to break even. Uh, here we are three years three years after recession supposedly ended. It doesn't feel that way for most of America. In Texas, we're doing a lot better. In our, our region, we're doing a lot better because we believe in lower taxes, balanced regulation. If you succeed, you succeed or fail on your own. That's Texas, but that isn't the way in the rest of the country. So we have the lowest quarter job growth in two years. Uh, we have 42 straight months of unemployment above 8%. That's the longest record since World War II. Uh, here's what ought to worry people, is that how many million Ameri millions of Americans have just given up looking for work? They're, they're able-bodied. They can work. Most of them want to work. They've just given up hope. We have the lowest number of people in the labor force than in three decades. And when you put them back in the way they should be put back in, our unemployment rate is way above 10%. So what we're seeing isn't even accurate about it. Economic projections for the year are getting lowered by the day, it seems like. Here's what's interesting. President Obama likes to talk about uh, his recovery and how great we're doing. But we've had 10 recessions since World War II. In 10 recoveries since World War II. Guess where this recovery ranks? Dead last. Dead last. Absolute dead last. 10th out of 10. In fact, here's a chart that lays out all the recoveries. President Obama's dead last half of what the average would be. Here's economic growth. Same thing, all the recoveries, this president dead last. But let me put it in real terms. Uh, if this president was just average, middle of the road, just nothing to speak about on, uh, on recessions and recoveries, if he's just average, 4 million more Americans would be going to work today rather than looking for work today. And if he were Ronald Reagan and followed the path of lower taxes and less government and more Main Street market, free market policies, seven million more Americans would have a job today and in, in fending for themselves, not, not uh, living, unfortunately, on welfare. Here is the stimulus. You know what the President promised America if we borrowed and spent all that money 
we know where the unemployment rate is and it's actually a lot higher than that. And here, I, I always point this out because talk about a difference of, uh, of um, values. You know, President Obama sincerely believes that you can tax and spend and borrow your way to prosperity. And look what he's done. President Reagan, just the opposite from that. Get Washington out of the way of our economy. Let Main Street business recover and look at the difference in job creation. And, and I look, took a look, look at the difference there. It's dramatic uh, uh, in, in job creation in the same time period. And so I was taking a look at Governor Romney's uh, um, jobs program the other day. He essentially follows the Reagan jobs approach, which created 9 million jobs just in those first three years. So when Democrats poo poo Governor Romney saying you can't create 12 million jobs, we, we already know what the recipe is. It's already proven to work. We just need to do it. Here's our spending crisis. I, I think I've shown you this chart before. We updated it, but you wouldn't know it. Uh, red is spending as our nation. You can tell we're right about here, getting ready to take off even worse. Green is the tax revenue. And you can tell here, you know, even with the ups and downs over the past 70 years, uh, we we average about 19% of our economy, you and I pay to cover the federal government. And even with ups and downs, it tends to average out. And after the economy gets better, it'll average out to that again. But look at the spending. You cannot, the two, the two takeaways from this chart is that you cannot tax your way back to a balanced budget. We could double everyone's taxes in America we could, we could take every dime the so-called wealthy earn, you wouldn't even balance the budget this year. Not even for one year. And the other part of this is that on the spending side, you can tell, you know, you just, unless you get control of spending, you, we are never gonna see a balanced budget in our lifetime. But, but I look at a chart like this in, in family terms, because my wife and I have two little boys. Uh, they started fourth grade and eighth grade today. My, cat, my wife is very happy. School's back in as of today. It was a long, long August. Um, but I always think about these charts in, in, in real terms. And what this says with the spending is that red ink already, a baby born today in Houston, their share of the federal spending in debt is already $47,000. So a baby born today owes Uncle Sam a new Lexus. If we don't change our ways as a nation, by the time they're 13, they'll owe a second Lexus. By the time they're 22, they're finishing college, getting ready to start their life, they'll owe Uncle Sam the third. Now the good news is young people don't buy luxury sedans for Uncle Sam, but they pay the price in a very real way. Just like in your business, when a country gets loaded so much in debt, the economy slows down. Uh, they raise taxes. It costs more to borrow, so your interest rates go up. And so what that means is for a young person, maybe your child or mine, when they get to be 22 and ready to start their life, there'll be fewer jobs for them to go after, and when they get one, there'll be less money in their pocket as a result. So there's a real price for the next generation from the spending of this generation. Something I said? <laughs> You know, do you remember the, the game Pong? Do you remember that? Oh, there it is. Darn it, I wanted that sound one more time. Oh, in, in the House, uh, we think there's a different path. We've passed Paul Ryan's Path to Prosperity. That uh, its goal isn't just to, to pay, to get back to a balanced budget. That's not good enough. The goal is the only budget, along with House Conservatives, that actually pays off the national debt pays it off, which is ought to be the goal. And I'll tell you, even, yeah, it ought to be, and no one talks about it. No one talks about it anymore, but that ought to be exactly the goal. And I'll tell you, this isn't a perfect budget. We House conservatives, we offered a budget that balances in six years. We only got 103 vote, 133 of us voted for it on the House floor. We still got some work to do. It's tough love. You can do it. But someone, at least the House, is pushing a, in a different direction from the country. And that's what Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan are going to talk about, I think, 
this week in Tampa. The tax cliff coming. You guys are very well informed, but a lot of, a lot of people have busy lives. They, they don't really see what's that, that train that's coming down the track on them. They don't see it till it's right on top of it. So I want to make sure that you are able to show, talk to your neighbors about the tax cliff coming up. This has never happened before. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee. We handle all tax issues. This never happened before where uh, all the tax relief is expiring on one day, December 31st. Some of it's already expired. The research and development tax credit, really important to our energy and healthcare businesses. State and local sales tax deduction, that's what I'm in charge of. 2004, we banned it with the seven uh, sales tax states to basically insist on fairness, which is if states that have an income tax, which wisely Texas does not, but they could deduct their state and local income taxes from, from Uncle Sam. And we insist that we be treated the same way. It's restored. It saves you and I about 1.2 trillion, billion, excuse me, a year. It means something. It's expired. On December 31st, all the Republican tax relief for all brackets expires. The alternative minimum tax, which is the Buffett rule of its day, you may remember 1960s, they created a second tax to tax 155 wealthy taxpayers so they would pay their fair share. Does that sound familiar? Yes. And now, that alternative minimum tax, a second tax to capture people, it now captures 3 million Americans. And if we don't stop it from expanding on uh, January 1st, 31 million Americans, including some of you in this room, will be caught by a double tax you never dreamed of. In fact, we talked. We were, uh, did a town hall at Chevron Phillips the other day. This gentleman, uh, uh, he works. His wife stays at home. They have five kids. They drive a 12-year-old van. They get caught in the AMT. And he said, "We are anything but wealthy." But that's what happens with you. The death tax springs back to life. I lead the coalition in uh, in Congress to abolish the death tax once and for all. John Thune carries it in the House. Expiring December 1st, capital gains and dividends will double or triple for some. Child tax credit will shrink by half. Marriage penalty comes back to life. College tax credit shrink. Small businesses have trouble buying equipment. Business, all that expires on December 31st. And this is what it means to you. In our 11 counties, in the 8th Congressional District, uh, that means every one of you will write a check that's $3,648 more to Uncle Sam. Now I know that figure doesn't sound like a lot in Washington. In, in our families, it's a lot. It's a lot of money. It's it's your utilities every month. It's your car insurance and others every month. It's it's real money. We can't allow those taxes to go up. And here's what it means: the average we know, but you know, baby boomers, three thousand dollar tax increase. Young workers, thousand dollars. Retirees. This number is actually pretty low because the president's proposing to double and triple capital gains and dividends. And for seniors, the number one source of income after Social Security is dividends. You know, so when you double and triple those taxes, a couple things happen. Businesses quit giving dividends, and when you get them, you keep less of them. And so that's what's going to hammer families of all income rates at the end of the year uh, if we don't stop the tax on Here's the president's plan. Uh, I was invited by the National Federation of Independent Business to help unveil a study by Ernst & Young about a month ago in Washington. They basically had that uh, consulting firm, accounting firm, analyze the president's tax hikes on supposedly the wealthy, which by the way hits Main Street uh, businesses in a major way. And here's what their study showed. That if we put in play, if we allow the president uh, to raise taxes, 700,000 Americans will go to the unemployment line. Texas gets hit particularly hard. 57,000 people lose their jobs. A million businesses along Main Street are hit with higher taxes. And here's what's interesting. We know when you raise taxes, investment falls. We know the economy grows smaller. But here's what I don't think you, most people realize. That the average worker, because the economy slows down, doesn't get paid as much, so they see a 2% cut in their payroll or, or in their paycheck. Now, that may, again, not sound like much up there, but I don't know anyone who can afford any cuts in their paycheck, especially with everything 
more expensive than it's been in the past. And here's my question. If I came to you and said, hey, King Street Patriots, I've got a great plan for us. It's going to cost 700,000 jobs. The American economy will shrink. People will invest less. And by the way, you'll have less money in your paycheck at home. One, would you wonder how I got in this room to begin with? But two, you question my type of leadership on any issue. But that's exactly what the president's proposing with his tax increases on the wealthy. It's terrible for America. That's why in the House, Republicans, conservatives, we have passed a bill to stop the tax hike. Flat out, stop any tax hike on any American at any income level, period. And because we think the real problem is not just those tax increases, the problem is we have a horrible tax code that punishes people for saving and working hard and investing. We think we need to reform the whole tax code. So we passed a bill out of the House developed by Ways and Means Committee that basically not only sets about our principles for tax reform, in, in, in including that no American should pay more than 25% of their income to any government. We should. That is plenty. And the belief that America's tax code around the world, which went from first to worst, so our Texas companies, that when they compete for sales around the world, they, have, they drag with them the worst tax rates and code among any of our competitors, ought to change, and we change that as well. And what I love about the bill as well that we passed by a pretty strong measure in the House is that um, it forces Congress to put up or shut up. It actually sets a date for a guaranteed up or down vote by the House and the Senate on tax reform. So all these lawmakers who stand up there and tell you, man, we need to fix a tax code, well, we're going to give you a day that you can vote yes or no to do exactly that. And you're going to go on the record. Yeah, you're going to go on the record on it. So, and, and I'll tell you, too, I, I'm just, um, uh, I've worked on this issue quite a while. You know, I think where we're moving toward, which is a flat tax, is a good step forward, no question, but I still believe if we want the best tax code for our children and our, for, for our country, we would have a fair tax, a national retail sales tax. In my view, it's a little spicy for some lawmakers, so we're still building a foundation for it, but we, we're going to continue to educate. This is a good step forward. Uh, at the end of the year, you may have heard about these spending cuts to defense. Um, we've already cut the defense budget by half a trillion dollars. And we know the Pentagon wastes money, so we focus the cuts on where they waste it, which is how they buy things. We, we, have, we have a warehouse this big, I think, of reports showing us how the Pentagon wastes money in procurement. But this does something different. This cuts across the board, and, and it uh, hollows out our military. And this comes from the President's own Defense Secretary, where it will, we will take 100,000 soldiers, sailors, and marine airmen who've chosen a career to protect us, the 1% of Americans who volunteer to protect the 99% of us, who've chosen that as their life, will be kicked out of their career. We will have the smallest ground force since 1940, the, the fewest fleet of ships in 1915, smallest tactical fighter force in the history of the force. And in Texas, because because we have so many Texans who volunteer for the military, because we house so many of them in our bases, and because our communities build the technology and equipment and weapons for them, uh, the job loss in Texas will be between somewhere between 125,000, 160,000. But the, here's the real here's the real story. Uh, Vice President Cheney met with a group of lawmakers, a group of us, uh, a month or so ago, and he was relating to us how after they won the first Gulf War decisively with overpowering manpower, overpowering technology and weaponry, when they finished that successful mission, his first calls were to the Defense Secretary, his counterpart, and others in the Reagan administration to thank them for making the decisions to give them the troops and the weapons that they could win that battle a decade later. His point to us is America 
is going to face real threats. We continue to. We're going to fight the next threat with the decisions we make today. So I think there are real ways to cut this budget, but hollowing out our military is just not a smart way to do it. The House, we, we've acted. We, we passed a bill to cut just as much out of the budget because we've got to keep cutting. In fact, we've cut $20 trillion out of the budget, all of it sitting in the Senate right now. We said let's cut all that as much, but let's do it from, from uh, programs where we're wasting money. For example, the Treasury Department, and you've, you've heard about this because I know I've done, I don't know how many interviews with Matt Patrick and Joe Paggs and a bunch of people about this. Are you government? takes your tax dollars, seven and a half billion dollars of it, and sends government checks to parents who claim the child tax credit for, and they're not here legally, their children don't exist, or they live outside this country. Seven and a half billion dollars in a program. And in, 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 uh, uh, Social Security and the Treasury has actually uh, punished workers who brought this fraud to them even though they had workers who said, you know, it should be a red flag that 100 homes have, have made 54,000 applications for this tax credit to get some $80 million of your government checks. These aren't reductions in their tax. These are government checks. And they were punished for bringing that red flag. My thought is, given the choice between hollowing out those who protect us and stopping waste like that, which is the smarter choice? The waste like that. So again, we pass it in the House. It's over in the Senate. Who knows if they ever act on this? But come come January 1st, we, we start damaging our military in a big way. I want to talk about regulation. I just came from a uh, a power plant in um, in uh, near Anderson in Grimes County. Um, this is this is the average red tape a typical small business faces every day, from permitting to, uh, to uh, privacy laws, to personnel, to the environment, to um, uh, uh, death tax, bankruptcies, pricing rules, FTC, Dodd-Frank. This doesn't even include state red tape or local red tape. This is what is strangling our, our businesses along Main Street. We put the chart together on the Joint Economic Committee because our businesses, when they try to explain to lawmakers who've never run a business, just how strange, it, it, they just get frustrated. And they just can't get across. And you can always tell someone who's never run a business because they'll say, uh, well, well, which regulation is the problem? No, it's not which. It's all of them. It's the burden of them. So we put this together. And by the way, when uh, we were, Democrats criticized us about, look, that chart, you're just making these things up. Uh, we pointed out, uh, we got it from the White House's own website. Um, uh, the Small Business Administration, the IRS, lay out all these regulations. In fact, if you walk through any one of these, there's a whole new uh, labyrinth of regulation. But there's a price to be paid for this chart as well. Fully half of businesses in America say they are not hiring now and won't be hiring because of all the red tape and regulation coming their way in Obamacare. Um, this White House has added 2,000 new regulations to America just, just since New Year's Day. Think about where you were then. Today, 2,000 new regulations for our businesses to have to grapple with. They're on pace to add more in their first term than any White House in American history. And the price of this is jobs. And the price to this chart just red tape and average small business on Hempstead Highway, they pay over $10,000 per worker every year to comply with government. Just the red tape. Well, no wonder they're not hiring. And no wonder they don't feel certain enough to add the new sales force, buy that new piece of equipment, do what they want to do to get this economy going. It's red tape. In the House, we pass legislation that does a couple of things on regulations. First, we call a timeout on new regulations till we can get the economy back on track. I mean, enough's enough, time out on all this. Secondly, we stop these abuses called midnight regulations. That's where a White House is voted out, and when, as they go out the door, they load the government with all these regulations going out the door. We stop that. We stop sue and settle. 
which you, you've probably heard about, but this is where groups sue the federal government, usually environmental groups, sometimes others, but they sue the government, they win, but what they extract is not money or other concessions, they extract new regulations often which land on our Texas businesses, especially our energy, our refinery, those who are trying to actually make America more self-sufficient as a nation in, in energy, uh, uh, that's where these sued and settled cases go. The, the laws and bills we passed stop all that. Guess where all that's sitting? The Senate. Yeah, exactly right. Let's talk about Obamacare. You, you've seen this chart. Uh, this is a chart after this bill passed, uh, with no one having read it, I asked our economists on the Joint Economic Committee, I said, I want you to go through the bill, every provision, and I want you to put on, put a, or create an organization chart so the American public can actually see how this new law works. And so they spent four months, evenings and weekends, going all through 2,801 pages to create an organization chart. And this is what they finished with. This one is actually uh, reflects the Supreme Court ruling that, that a terrible ruling, tortured ruling that was dead wrong, that changed the, the mandate that everyone have government approved health care. They decided that was a tax and they gave states like Texas the chance to opt out of Medicaid. But what they left in place between your doctor and you as a patient, 159, new federal agencies, bureaucracies, and commissions in between you and your doctor. Le left in place in these green boxes a trillion dollars of new taxes, half of which hit the middle class in a major way. They left in place a half a trillion dollars of cuts to our seniors, local hospitals, home health care, skilled nursing homes, um, hospice centers, including significant cuts to Medicare Advantage. The, the most popular plans for seniors in Texas, uh, plans that by the best estimate we have is between one third and a half of Texas seniors will either be forced out of their Medicare Advantage plan or will pay significantly more just to keep the plan they have as a result of Obamacare. And what's frustrating is all those cuts, at least 95% of them, hit our seniors after the November election. So it's all sugar now. All the pain comes after ballot time. And it was designed to do that. And by the way, it leaves in place, you know these rust colored boxes, uh, circles? These are future rationing boards. They are designed by law uh, to cut reimbursements, deny reimbursements for seniors in the future. But they don't ration care by telling you no, you can't have that surgery, or no, you can't have that treatment, they just deny your local doctor or hospital reimbursement for that surgery or that treatment. And they have remarkable power. It's one of the, one of the issues Paul Ryan is so good at debating, but that's what they left in place. Supreme Court, though, actually said something, and I was oh, so disappointed. Um, you know, Justice Kennedy was the one I was worried about. Yeah. <laughs> and he got it right. Yeah. But he just nailed the ruling. It was so tortured. And, uh, but in that ruling, they, in effect, said uh, the Supreme Court um, uh, cannot save the American public from their political decisions. In effect, if you want to repeal this thing, you have to do it at the ballot box. And so that's exactly what we have to do. And I'm going to finish, Mark, with this, uh, with this chart because at the end of the day, just as true the vote, vote lays out, just as your and our grassroots efforts is all designed to let the public's voice be heard, in November you and I are going to make decisions that, that decide what direction we go because um, at the end of the day, this is probably the key issue that is at every fight, in the middle of every fight we have in Washington. The main one is, is the problem we got that the government spends too much or is the problem it doesn't take enough of what you earn? <laughs> that is at the heart of every fight we have and we'll only settle that at the ballot box. Que another question, how large a government do you want and are you willing to pay for? 
Because at the end of the day, it always comes down to us to pay this. And then finally, do you want Obamacare to stand as the law of the land? That's what you and I will decide in November. Yeah, I'm thinking no, you know, uh, on that. In fact, we have, we have voted to repeal, repeal or defund it now more than 33 times. Guess where all that's sitting? In the Senate. So when we repeal this president, we need to repeal some senators to go along with him. Yeah. Mark, right. no, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. 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 Like a few announcements. Okay. And uh, sure. Great job, right? Thank you very much. We, we are going to have some time for questions, and again, if you have those questions, please write them down on the card. Don't put them in the hat. Put them, just hand them to somebody. They're going to, I know, people already do that, don't they? Karen in the green is going to take them up. Give it up for Karen Hubs. So we are passing the hat. If you are new to King Street, this is how we keep our lights on. The air conditioner going. I don't know about you, but it seems a little warm in here today. And it's also how we pay the HPD officers to keep people out. So, and just on, on a little side note, I went out there, they're gone. Yeah. Oh. Hello. It's like, what slackers, man? And I was like, come on. No, I, I don't know. But tonight is a little different with our hat, all right? I want to talk a little bit about Brigadier General Jim Hall. Kath, uh, Catherine was in Colorado and heard about him. Basically, the guy... This guy is crazy. This guy is the greatest generation's parachuting pioneer and visionary. He actually kind of invented the parachute that they use now and trained and how to steer and all that stuff. He joined, joined up at age 16, enlisted for World War II, and uh, he's approximately 85 years old now. He is uh, suffering from back injuries that he sustained in combat. And our goal is, we, we like to do, is raise about 2500 bucks for him because he's got medical bills that are just taller than me. And if we can, we would like to help him. So uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take, if you missed the hat and you want to do a little bit more for that, that's fantastic. They'll have them on the way out. So please, if you can, just throw a little something extra in there for that because he's done a tremendous amount for our country. So we want to do that for him. Next Monday, we are off. Happy Labor Day. Enjoy it. I am not going to be here on Monday. So I'm excited about that. And I mean here. I'm not being in Houston, but just not here. If you have not seen the number four movie in America right now, who the fuck is it? Huh? You know, we saw that. I saw this over when it came out. You know, we saw it. We had the, the whatever. We got invited to go see it, so we went and saw it. And, and I was thinking at the time, oh, it's a pretty good movie, you know? Too bad. It's not going to do very well. Yeah. It's doing fantastic. It's, it's doing great. great. It's actually going to, it may actually beat um, an inconvenient truth. So that, that'll be exciting. Uh, if you can, we are going to start ramping up after Labor Day. As you all know, there's an election. Did you know that? Uh, I heard about it. There's a little bit of an election coming up in November, and we actually need a bunch of people to help us watch those uh, polls and the election workers at those polls. So if you can and have some time, either during early voting or on election day, did you realize too that you can take the day off of work and not be penalized for that? Mm -hmm. Did you know that? No. Uh, no? Uh, Didn't? You can't. Let me. You can't. It's a good It's a good law. You, you voted for it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good law. So please help us out. On that note too, with regards to poll watchers, Especially now, we're starting to get a little bit of scrutiny, a little, you know, a little people paying attention or whatever. If somebody comes up and jams a camera in your face or a microphone or something like that, I would ask that you be honest and don't, you know, we've got absolutely nothing to hide, but please don't be what they expect you to be. Does that make sense? Okay. And don't play into that narrative for them because all they need is that one person for five seconds going, whoa, 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 and it's over. So. They tend to win. Uh, help us grow. Bring somebody. Get a book. They get the Constitution. We're still doing this. If you can bring somebody new for the first time, we'll hand them a pocket Constitution. You'll get one of the free books there, either Subversion or Aftershock. Again, still making great Christmas gifts. Just saying. <laughs> and that's it. We are going to open it up to questions, I understand. And I have one that was emailed to us. Are you ready for this? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, I'm just checking. Uh, thank you, 
Yes, sir. Um, the first question we got, we got this in an email from somebody out in Kingwood, and it asked, why did you vote yes on the bill S-679, Presidential Appointment Efficiency and Streamlining Act of 2011, giving the president authority to fill 170 executive post positions without congressional approval? And I know it's complicated, so. No, great, great question. And, and here it is, Constitution allows Congress to uh, vest in the president the right to appoint certain inferior officers, those without policy decisions, issues like that. And that's what that bill does, identifies a bunch of offices that don't have to go through all the work of Senate confirmation so we can focus on the czars and the real appointments that affect our country. Here's an example. Right now under current law, uh, Senate has to examine, investigate, hold hearings, and ratify the commissioner of the Office of Navajo and Hopi Relocation. The federal co-chairman of the Appalachian River Authority. The members of the National Museum Board. You know, look, uh, those may be important positions. That's not what I want the Senate scrutinizing. I want scrut people being scrutinized that handle our debt and our treasury and EPA. You know what I mean? All these, all these important positions. So it seemed to me a smart move to focus on what matters and don't worry about the ones that don't. Okay. Great. Now this is a question that was written down that I'll read that I don't happen to agree with but I have zero confidence in the current Republican leadership in Congress. Do they really understand a word you said? And the answer is yeah, they do. Okay. Uh, in fact, they've cut us loose. And he thinks so. Okay. Uh, they've cut us I loose do. on both ways and means in joint economic committee to be fighting Obamacare, to be fighting for lower taxes. We actually have solutions on Medicare and, uh, and Social Security that, that, that this president won't even touch. Uh, so yeah, I think they do. I think it's frustrating to be fighting against both the Senate and the White House mm -hmm. in this environment. I, I, I'll tell you, no one, no one on our side is satisfying at all. In okay, fact, good. we're probably more frustrated than you all. Yeah, and I think part of that is, and part of it for me anyway, is we see lip service a lot and then we see some different results maybe. And it's just hard to kind of sometimes reconcile those two things. It is uh, and I understand it's extremely complicated, too. It is, but you know, a lot of this is, is a case of, again, Mark, we literally have sent $20 trillion of cuts to the Senate. It's just sitting there. Just We've passed 30 bills that rein in the EPA, that reverses all this regulation, and actually addresses the things that, that are slowing this economy. It's all sitting in the Senate. And the Constitution says, the House presents its ideas, and the Senate presents theirs, and then you try to work it out. But only one chamber in that constitutional process, in my view, is actually doing its job. And so, yeah, it is really, really frustrating. And, and on that note, what are the odds that that changes in November? It's going to be really tight. Uh, it's going to, it's a, a coin toss at this point. Uh, John Cornyn is leading the charge, and... Uh, you know, I think uh, he's hoping for a 52-48 Republican majority in the Senate. Uh, it could be tighter than that, Frank. It could be a 50-50 proposition over there. The reason I want a conservative Republican majority is to force them to take the votes they should be taking. I mean, that, that's, that's what a Republican majority brings, that you actually hold people accountable. This is an easy one. Where can people find a copy of that chart you showed? Yeah, come to our come to our website. Uh, just Google Representative Kevin Brady. We're the first one that pops up. We have it there on the website. Doctor, you know too. On Joint Economic Committee, we got great information on Obamacare, uh, on uh, the President's economy is dead last. Uh, so we've got some great information. Say it again. What's that? Say the website again, please. Just uh, Representative Kevin Brady. Google it, it pops right up. I think, Tracy, what's what's her address? KevinBrady.house.gov. <laughs> KevinBrady.house.gov. Easy enough, very good. All right, this is, uh, I'll read it how it's written. How does the administration spend money with the legislature funding programs? Well, it's frustrating. Uh, 
because we do hold the purse. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, we've slowed spending a little bit, uh, nowhere near what it takes uh, to really turn this thing around. Uh, and we just haven't got the cuts. We okay. just haven't yet. How come so many of the tax codes have time limitations? Well, uh, I'm not hammering on the Senate. But I'll tell you, when President Bush proposed real tax cuts in 2001, 2003, they didn't have these time limits on But to get past the Senate filibuster rules, they had to st stuff a 10 pounds of tax cuts into a five pound bag. And the way they did it, it was to put sunset dates on it so that you could get the immediate relief. So that's why they've all expired. It, it is no way to run a railroad. Right. This is not how you should do a tax code. Right. Have you, have you seen Obama 2016? I'm not, but I'm going to. <coughs> I'm anxious to. That's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you guys. I mean, I've got <laughs> books here, and I'm trying to read and listen at the same time, so it's a little bit hard. But what is it that... Um, can the House and Senate, and again, we're not trying to beat up on the Senate, both coordinate daily? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay. We're not. Okay, I get it. Remember, the protesters are out there if you want to go join us. No, it's all right. And I understand the frustration. We're all frustrated, I think, right? But uh, why can't the House and Senate both coordinate daily, weekly news conferences and kind of talk about Obama and Harry Reid and their behavior and your frustrations. We do. We do. We do. I would say two to three times a week we, we call the president in the White House on the claims they're making through their whole cabinet on all of this. Guess how much you see? Zero. 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 It, I, I'm tell, I watched Eric Cantor. I watched John Boehner. I watched Paul Ryan, I watch them all, I mean, every week pounding back on it. Yeah. And it's like you're invisible. That's why we are here. That's why you're so important. I, I know we, I, I do 50 town hall meetings a year at least. Wow. And, the, and the goal of that is to get around the media up in Washington and to drive a message home here. That's why you're so critical. That's why you're winning, you're driving that message. But yeah, it's hard for us. Yeah. You mean they don't lie. I think we I think we kind of saw some of that up front there. Last question, and, and, and then I think if it's all right, are you got time to stick around for that? Absolutely. Two and I'm you know, and I after this. Tell one story if I could as we finish. So okay, sure. Uh, and I got this, Larry. Here we go. Will you vote to raise the debt ceiling? Not without major, major, real cuts. You know, and 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 I don't know Trade anyone off. in the house. That, the only way we got the two trillion, which is a drop in the bucket, uh, was that way. But with the new president, I'm telling you, we can get some real cuts through. I'm telling you. Good it's, deal. Okay. Can I finish with this point? Yes. Um, and, and how many of you, how many of you watched the Olympics? When they're, I, I couldn't quit watching at night uh, after work. Anyway, yeah, I fell in love with those, our women gymnasts. You know, they were just, am yeah, I didn't they're fall great. No, I I'm you said that kind of strange. I loved uh, uh, what they are doing, but I realized as watching them at night and with my son, uh, one of them that was watching, 13 year old with me, is that those little girls actually exemplify the American dream. Yes. You know, think about it. you're 14 years old, my son's eight. You talk your parents into moving halfway across the country, pursuing your dream. They have to take a second job to pay to help you try to pursue your dream. You work seven, eight hours, this is all you focus on. You go to London and you compete on the world stage. You have absolutely no guarantee of success or failure. All you're asking for is the opportunity mm -hmm. to succeed or fail on your own. And if you succeed, you succeed spectacularly to do it. We got to get away from government, looking to government for all the answers. If government did not build those uh, gold medals for those girls right. in, in <laughs> they did not. Um, they did. And uh, if we'll get away from Washington uh, uh, has a solution and they need to help us and back to just that American dream, give us a chance to succeed or fail on its own, we'll be fine as a country. That's anyway, right. thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And that's it, everybody.
everybody. Thank you so much for coming. He is going to sit around for questions over here, so uh, have a good night. Be careful out there. Thank you. Good to see you.